and I'll turn it over to you, Lexi, Rick. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, in the Lakota worldview, uh, we have, uh, uh, I guess, um, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, and we can see your screen. Okay. So, using Lakota, Lakota culture and tradition for wellness. So, uh, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to cover. Um, and uh, in our culture and in our worldview, uh, there's diagnoses that are not, uh, I guess, al in alignment with uh, the Western diagnosis. Uh, so um, we have uh, our own diagnosis and our own worldview on how we, um, I guess, uh, a lot of times we use our cultural interventions to help people. So this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So um, one of the things is the impact of grief and loss on uh, in the workplace or in the home. Uh, so uh, one of the things we see today, which is uh, kind of foreign to us long ago as Lakotas, uh, is there's the com competing demands of work and grief. So um, like a lot of times in our workplaces, uh, we have this like competition uh, and that's something that's um, kind of foreign to us in, in the sense that uh, there was a time when everything was geared towards the good of the people. So um, when you study the, um, Lakota language, there's uh, three concepts in the Lakota language um, of uh, the um, verb, conjugations of the verb, the word that shows action. So it's everything, the language is based around um, uh, nie, mie, and unkie. So uh, we live in the worldview of um, unkie. And then there was nie and then mie. So we always put ourselves lastly uh, whenever we, um, whenever we um, functioned as a, a Lakota society a long time ago. So everything was geared towards the good of the people. And then next you look to your uh, fellow uh, relative around you, whether they were related by blood or not. And so you uh, centered on the concept of nia. So, and then lastly, uh, we always put ourselves last, mie. So after um, everything was done, like a communal hunt, um, everybody hunted the buffalo uh, with the idea of unkie, we, we will survive as a people. Uh, and then, we looked at Nie, which was uh, the Oshpaye, the Wichoti, the Oshpaye, the Tioshpaye, and then the um, Tiwahe. So we, we focused always on that. We made sure everybody got something to eat. Uh, and then we made sure that as a, as a whole, as the camp circle, and then our neighbors and our relatives and our Tioshpaye and then ourselves. So um, through this way of the, the worldview is uh, we uh, survived as a, per, as a people. So um, what we deal with a lot today is uh, grief. There's a lot of loss within our families. I, I went to a school here on the reservation and um, the class was, fifth to eighth grade. And I asked the, these young, these Takojas, I said, how many of you had a loss within this year? And about 90 to 95% of them uh, raised their hand. So these young people 
are living with a lot of grief in their lives. And a lot of times uh, we as grown-ups, our older people, we focus on ourselves when there's a time of loss, a time of grief. And we kind of forget the children and uh, kind of expect them to kind of fend for themselves. And we don't really uh, look at them as uh, them also going through a grieving process. Uh, so uh, when a person's in, in uh, grief, they're kind of like they feel out of sync, unfocused, uh, detached, distracted. Uh, and I think today, um, today we don't have uh, a grieving process within like our workplaces. I know like uh, bereavement leave, uh, you're given so, so much time. Uh, I don't know, you know, it varies from organization to organization, but uh, a lot of times it's not, not enough time. Uh, I, I've worked with programs where uh, they would give you time, but, uh, it, you know, when you're not really uh, proud, you haven't really processed your grief and your loss, when, then you're expected to um, go back to work. So um, that a lot of times is um, hard for, for us uh, because we haven't, we weren't given the time to work through this grief. So there's Lakota stages of grief. So um, whenever something happens, like a sudden, suddenly you get a phone call and uh, you get this phone call that maybe a close relative was like killed in a car accident. So your first reaction is in our language, which is shock. Uh, and then you you have what is called khawachi enana iyaya, like a disorganized thinking. And then uh, there's instances of wochanzeke, anger. And then we see a lot of times in our families, el akichapi, like blame. We blame each other, or we blame a lot of times, um, like. Uh, I had a, a grandson that committed suicide and right during the time uh, they cut him down, uh, I and Mahasan, he went there and I made a prayer for him and I touched him on the forehead and he was still warm. Uh, so I prayed for him and then we went upstairs and his girlfriend was coming across the street. She wanted to, she heard the news and she was crying and she was coming. And here, uh, my grandson's sisters, my granddaughters uh, blamed her. They said, you're the one that caused this and you drove this, to, drove him to this. And they were gonna uh, confront her physically, you know? And, and, and uh, there would have been like a, a fight there. So uh, Mahasani kind of diffused the situation and talked to them. So. Uh, they settled down, but uh, they still wouldn't allow her to come across the road and see him. So that's that's kind of an example of how the blame is put on somebody. And then there's the hechetu yawapi, the acceptance. So that part um, is hard to work through. Uh, you know, accepting the death, it takes time to uh, adjust without uh, your loved one. So uh, the old men, we talked a lot, say that it takes a year. You have to go through the four uh, seasons without them. So uh, in modern times, you know, there's we go through the holidays and then we go through their birthdays and then we go through our birthdays, the family's birthdays. And then the loss is there. We feel, we feel their loss. Uh, then there is a uh, there is a concept inam chab chab yea. It's like swallowing the pain and moving for uh, moving forward. So um, a lot of times uh, we have to swallow our grief. This is kind of the um, way of saying that swallowing your grief because uh, people don't understand. You know, people. 
uh, don't uh, really know what you're going through until they've gone through it themselves. But uh, by human nature, a lot of times people are indifferent to, you know, what you're going through. So uh, when I lost my parents, uh, that didn't stop people from coming to my doorway and seeking my help. So uh, even though I was in grief, I had to put my grief aside and, and help them. So I had to swallow the pain and move forward in, in this instance. So there is a physical response to grief. Chante uh, iabhapi, increased heart rate and blood pressure, feeling of being overwhelmed. Oh, ankhya niyapi, rapid breathing. Timnit api, perspiring uh, with like sweaty palms and uh, feeling the uh, the pressure of what just happened. And then you then you experience also tezi washi chapi, like indigestion and nervous stomach. So in the workplace, what to expect from employee experiencing grief in mourning. So uh, this employee might have withdrawals. Uh, they, you might notice they have a loss of energy and interest. Uh, they, of course, they have sadness, anger, uh, temporary depression. And then sometimes this depression isn't temporary. Uh, it, it lingers with them for uh, a long time if there's, uh, there isn't any kind of uh, intervention, whether it's through the Western way or uh, through the traditional way, they need some type of um, intervention. And then they need time to adjust. So when loss includes trauma, this can prolong grief, cause anxiety and numbing. So, um, a lot of we see this a lot with uh, young people in our in our communities. Um, they uh, have prolonged grief, they have anxiety, and they have numbing. So, uh, due to through research, uh, that's a, a, one of the uh, outcomes of the numbing is you see these young people cutting on themselves, uh, and the cutting. Uh, is because of the numbing. They want to feel something, e even if it's just pain. They want to feel it. They, they, they don't like this feeling of numbness. So that's how they'll cut their uh, wrists or some, some of them will cut their legs so that it doesn't show. Um, but you look around, if you walk through the hallways of these uh, schools, uh, even some you know, of the lower lower classes, lower elementary, you'd see third, fourth graders with uh, scars and cuts on their arms. And, you, and you'll and you see it in uh, junior high and you'll see it in uh, the high schools. You see these young people with these cuts on their hands and their arms and even their legs. So they're, they're trying to feel uh, because uh, they're going, they have numbing, so they want to feel. But they say a lot of, uh, in the Western world, they say uh, uh, the next step from cutting is uh, suicide ideation and attempts. So the international intergenerational layers of grief. Uh, so the impact of unresolved grief is repressed anger, rage, substance, abuse, non-communicative illness and sickness. So we see this a lot in our society, even older people have a lot of uh, repressed anger. They have a lot of rage. Uh, that's why you see in these communities, especially where they live close together, like in these housing clusters, you see a lot of uh, uh, violence, people turning on each other. And you see homicides a lot of times, you know, uh, uh, a person will, you know, beat someone to death with a bat or something, uh, not satisfied, you know, with just 
uh, arguing or like that, they'll turn to violence uh, and the rage that they carry. And you see that a lot among the young people too. They have a lot of repressed anger and they have a lot of rage. And so, and of course the substance abuse, abuse and then non-communicative um, like, and then illness and sickness. But you see a lot of these young people in these classrooms and in these schools, uh, they, they have their head down and they have their hair in their eyes and they look down and some, and a lot of them, I noticed they, um, they have these hoodies with the sweaters and they put the hoodie, the hood on and then they hide their face inside this hood. Uh, they don't want to look up. They don't want to uh, acknowledge you if you talk to them, you know. And so a lot of times, especially the people that don't know our culture and what we've been through, like non-native people that come to teach here, they get upset at these young people because they're acting this way, but they really don't know, you know, what's going on in our communities, what happened to us throughout the generations. So you have an example here, a 14 year old boy who lost his mother. So this is his first layer of loss. And then his mother lost her mother at an early age. So that's the second layer of loss. And then the mother's father lost his father at an early age, third layer of loss. And then in the fourth generation, the mother's father's mother lost their parents at wounded knee. Uh, massacre 1890. So this grief, uh, through research, they finally found out, even though we've always known it, that uh, this anger uh, and this uh, trauma is passed down from generation to generation. So in our language, we have a word for it. We, we say Iowanie. Iowanie is like, Io is like, transmitting it and wania means is the word kind of like a uh, uh, word for saying that it's alive that we passed it down to the next generation and it's it's alive it has a spirit so this but we have also a strength as a people we have survivorship resiliency we're basically strong people and we're adaptable uh, we can adapt to any situation, uh, our, especially our ancestors. When we came onto the, the reservations, you know, we were literally stripped of everything. So uh, the people got together and uh, said that since we're going to live here and we can't leave, then we'll build log houses. So they all came together, whole Teoshpais, and they built each other log houses. And then they survived the best way they could because the government rations weren't always dependable. So um, they started to um, acquire like chickens and cows and they started to raise them. Uh, they helped each other. When somebody didn't have anything, uh, the other people will come and help them uh, with food or whatever they needed. So we helped each other that way to survive especially at the turn of the, the uh, 19, uh, 20th and 19th century, right around the eight, late 1800s and the early 1900s was really a hard time for our people because uh, there was a drought among our people. And then, like I said, the rations didn't come like what the government promised. So, um, and then there was um, a lot of sickness move through the people and one of the things that hit us was the tuberculosis epidemic so our people were really having a hard time and a lot lots and lots of our people uh, died during this time because um it was um this epidemic lasted from the late 1800s all the way to the 1950s so it was a it, it wasn't probably like that on the outside, but among us, this uh, epidemic uh, really um, devastated our people. Uh, I remember as a young boy, 9, 10, 11 years old, I remember some of my friends, they took them because they uh, contracted tuberculosis. So they took them to the Susan and uh, 
Rapid City and some of my friends were gone for like a, maybe one or two years. Some of them, some of them came back within a year. Some of them came back with huge scars on their sides and their back where they removed their lungs. And so they came back and they only had one lung. So we, um, we went through that. So this, this uh, epidemic we're going through now, you know, that's, that's nothing new to our people. Uh, and we adapted, we adapted to, to it, you know. And then um, one of the things soon as the, uh, soon as the, the medicine, uh, the vaccine came out, everybody uh, went by the hundreds and thousands and got vaccinated. We also had in those days, people don't know, but like contact tracers. So if you were near somebody that was diagnosed, they went through the community and they took you in right away. So I was taken into the clinic three times because I came in contact with people with um, uh, tuberculosis. So, but that time they didn't make it a political thing. You know, everybody went out and uh, got vaccinated right away. Uh, got the vaccination, and so uh, I always remember that it's it's kind of a lavender colored uh, liquid that they put on sugar cubes and you dissolved it in your mouth. It wasn't a shot, but nobody made a political anything political out of it. They just went and and we kind of pretty much eradicated the uh, the vi uh, the disease among us. There's still instances of it here and there, but. Uh, it wasn't killing the people like it, 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 you know, it did before. So whenever you have prolonged response to grief, uh, there's like uh, you feel this, they have feelings of being pressured or driven. Uh, the exhaustion and fatigue. Nihincha like anxiety. This anxiety is really a powerful thing, especially for like people that go untreated, uh, whether it's like again like West in Western society, or um, in the in the traditional ways. There's ways of dealing with it. There's we have herbs that can help you with anxiety and depression. So that's really uh, strong. You know, it's a it's a real strong response to this grief that, that a lot of our young people have this anxiety they they carry it every day and uh i've i've dealt with young people who were uh, suffering with this and they say that uh they feel like something terrible is going to suddenly happen and they they want some type of uh, reassurance that everything's going to be okay so they have a they really have a hard time and if they go to um uh, uh like IHS, uh, they'll give them medication, uh, mood stabilizers, uh, but uh, it's kind of like uh, I noticed it turns them like, uh, like they 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 have no feelings and it's kind of like they just uh, just exist. They 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 don't really like talk or anything in it. And a lot of times when you're under these medications, you sleep a lot. Uh, also, another one is Wa'ektunjapi, the memory loss. So whenever you have people in grief, and even in a, that people that have gone through trauma, they have memory loss. So they can't remember things. And that's one of the reasons why some of our young people do poorly in school, because they can't remember things. It affects them in that way. And then the Ijehan Kujapi, like persistent symptoms of illness and sickness. So uh, these children say they're sick, or these people say they're sick, and they take them to the ER, and they can't find anything medically wrong with them. But with these, inside these young people, and, and also older people, our relatives, is, is this feeling of something wrong and being sick is, is real to them. You know, uh, a lot of times, these uh, these people in these clinics and these at the ER kind of like say you know there's nothing wrong with you and they um, they kind of play it off you know but it's a it's a symptom of of this prolonged uh, grief uh, 
Vashigla ekigna kapi o kipsni. That's the word for unresolved grief. So in the Lakota way, Vashigla to grieve, mourn, wa is like spiritual, sacred, sacred, shigla to carry grief in historical times when a warrior was killed. Washigla meant to carry revenge. So um, today um, we could we could still use that concept because um, you could uh, take have revenge on something that killed your relative, whether it's uh, a drunk driver or whether it's alcohol or whether it's a sickness, diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer. You, that's the enemy. So in our Lakota worldview, we say taku unyutaku nipshnikte. Whatever will annihilate or eradicate us is an enemy to us. So, um, so that's what we say that is an enemy to us. So taku unyutaku nipshnik is whatever will eradicate us. So that's an enemy. Washigla um, ekignaka okihishni. So unresolved grief. Uh, to conduct oneself with humility when in mourning. Uh, focus on positive thoughts, words, and deeds, par particularly during the time of mourning. So there's a concept among our people that we call ayapi. So whatever is done during the four days during the morning period, particularly the four days after the burial, will become of that part of that person's life and personality. So when we have a loss, unfortunately, in our communities, what happens is a lot of times uh, there's anger, blame, uh, and then right among inside families, there's infighting. Uh, and then there's some people will turn to alcohol. So I remember when I was young, I remember when I was young, uh, you go to a wake, everybody there was drunk. And there's instances of where uh, people buried their relatives while they were drunk. And I remember a case where uh, this man died and everybody was drunk and they buried him. And a year later, they were gonna put up a headstone for him, but um, everybody that was there that buried him was drunk. So they can't remember where they buried him. They couldn't remember which grave was his. So they had the headstone and everything. And finally they said, okay, well, I think it's this grave. So we'll pick this grave. And um, they named him. They said, so-and-so. They said, Holeek de Lodis. This is him. And they put the headstone there. And, and really, maybe that's not, maybe that wasn't even him. But somebody, you know, maybe if it wasn't him, but somebody got a headstone out of it. But, uh, so those things like that happen, and, and some of you that are old enough to remember uh, when you went to a powwow too, everybody was drunk. The singers, the people dancing, the spectators. So um, whenever the uh, sobriety movement happened, uh, it, it to a certain degree, we might not think so in our community because there's still people that are drinking, but it's not it's not as bad as it used to be i would say uh the older people know what i'm talking about and will agree with me that uh it, it was bad you know i mean everybody was drunk no matter where you went whether it was a powwow or a wake or whatever you know the the, the people were all most of the people were all drunk so um so whenever we have a funeral or a wake and then someone dies, we have conflict there, inner fighting. Uh, and I don't know if this applies to other societies and races of people, but we fight over the body a lot of times. You know, what people, and I've seen that a lot of times where um, maybe this man was married, so his wife's side of the family wanted to 
do uh, the services their way and then uh, maybe the, the man's families that side wanted to do it a certain way. So uh, there would be conflict. Uh, and I even know of um, a time where I and my wife went to this wake and they said right before we got there, uh, this young boy uh, who died, he said his girlfriend and his ex-girlfriend uh, got in a fight right in front of the casket. They, they actually had a fist fight. So, um, so the drinking and the fighting is, is a part of Ayapi. So if, if you drink when your relative died, then that uh, is going to stay with you. So you'll probably always, always uh, be uh, controlled by alcohol. So they say ayah api. So ayah api is also another way to um, describe how uh, you become controlled by alcohol or drugs. So they say ayah api. So you're where you're um, hooked to these drugs and, and you can't uh, pull yourself away from it. So on the opposite side, if during the time you're in mourning, if you a person in mourning speaks only kind, thoughtful words to others or does acts of kindness, then that will be reinforced in their life and personality. So, um, so it's important not to get angry, do negative things. It can become a way of life for that person. So if you say good things, then you're going to ayayich uh, that way too. That will become a part of your uh, of your personality, or if you do kind things, you know, help somebody, or you know, like that, then that will stay with you too. So um, it works on um, two ways. So the stages of grief, like the denial, the isolation, the anger, uh, the bargaining, the depression, and the acceptance. So whenever, uh, like say 1890, when our relatives were killed there, uh, the first thing they did is they had to run for their lives. Uh, and they probably uh, didn't calm down for several days. And then uh, like my grandmother, who I knew she was a survivor of the Wounded Knee Massacre, she had uh, PTSD. And I told that one time here, these people kind of laughed and thought that was uh, funny. But PTSD is not uh, just for people, soldiers that went to war. But uh, PTSD could be anybody that has gone through trauma. So even if you would never been to war, and even if you'd never been even off the reservation, you can have PTSD if you witnessed or was a victim of some type of trauma, you have um, PTSD, you'll have PTSD. So my grandmother who survived Wounded Knee Massacre and I used to stay with her and I would haul wood for her and chop wood and I would stay there with her and help her. Um, things would set it off. I remember one time I stayed with her because my parents went to a 4th of July powwow. So I stayed with her and across the street so far away, uh, these uh, children were setting off fireworks and it, it triggered, triggered uh, probably the sound of that fireworks reminded her of the gunfire at Wounded Knee. So she started to um, cover her ears and she started shaking and she was crying. And so uh, I... Um, sat there and I didn't know what to do. So I got some water and I gave it to her. And she told me to reach inside this uh, little tin suitcase under her bed. And she told me to get her pipe. So I got her pipe out and she told me to fill it. So I filled it for her and she held on to it and she was shaking and she was crying. And so eventually um, she wanted me to light the pipe for her. So I lit it for her and uh, she smoked it and then she cried and then she sang a song and it's kind of like a memorial song kind of almost like a death song she sang and she was singing and she would put her relatives names in the song and she uh 
took her a while to calm down. Uh, so, but she finally did come, calm down and she started to feel better. But she told me that the sound of those uh, fireworks set her off. She said another thing that would set her off was if she heard a child screaming. She said it, it takes her back to that time. So, um, so I would say, even though it seems funny to people nowadays, but I would say Unchi had PTSD. And I watched her every evening. Uh, Unchi would pack all her things in a bundle and put it under, under her bed. Um, uh, for the things that she valued, like her jewelry and her pipe and her beaded moccasins and uh, into a bundle and she would put it under her bed. So I, I, I asked her in Lakota, I said, Unchi takoe chanwe, because she said, so she said, grandson, we might have to run during the night. So I was thinking, uh, run from what or run from who? You know, um, only thing I could think of was maybe if some drunks came or something. But she was, re she was referring to like having to run whenever her people were killed at Wounded Knee. So... Um, that that always stayed with me uh, all all through my life how that triggered her into reacting in that way and then but it never missed she would do that every evening she would pack up her things and put it under the bed and then she never really ever that i know went into a deep sleep every little sound would wake her up like and she would get up and look around so she would be what she called hyper vigilant all the time, waiting for something to happen. So the stages of grief, working through pain of grief, accepting reality of the loss, adjusting to life without the loved one and adjusting emotionally. So uh, those the people that have gone through these losses, like if you're a Wablenicha, you're an orphan, you you experienced this. You had to go on without your mother, your father. Um, walk throughout uh, your life. You lost aunties, uncles, cousins, uh, your grandparents. So, um, if you ever get the chance, read this book by um, Siebert Youngbear. Um, and I can't remember, I think it's uh, Standing in the Light or something like that, but he wrote it uh, with uh, this man, Ronnie Ties. And he talks about the periods of a person's life and he gives names to it. And he says that when you're in your 40s and your 50s and in your 60s, he calls it walking over dead relatives. So that's what he's talking about is those are the years, the years of your life where you bury a lot of your relatives, a lot of your, uh, your grandparents probably, or they probably go, they're probably gone sooner than that. But your parents, your uncles, your aunties, some of your older cousins, you bury them during that time. So he calls it walking over dead relatives. Uh -huh. Uh, and then in the early 20s and 30s, he calls it uh, walking among the bees. So we child Paji Papi. So that's an analogy of uh, people around you that are jealous or that would, that would get jealous of you. Uh, so they say uh, that whenever someone gossips about you, then they say that we child Paji Papi Ota. There's a lot of bees people that uh, sting you with words and stuff. So he said, you walk among those people. And then, um, so when you get a little bit older, then that's when you walk over, they, you walk over your dead relatives. So coping with grief and loss is support is necessary to heal from loss. When grief and loss is ignored, healing process becomes immobilized. Acknowledged meant by others of relationship and the loss is necessary to healing. 
the healing of grieving of the grieving person. So um, one of the things is um, whenever you encounter this, you know, there's the, the concept among our people, uh, there's a, this word called wokik champte. So wokik champte is like giving words of comfort to this family. And so um, elders uh, used to do this, fulfill this role because uh, the, the, the elders have already gone through all the losses. You know, they buried their parents, their cousins. Uh, some of them even have buried their children. So they know the losses of what they've gone through. So they can speak from experience, you know. You wouldn't ask a young person uh, to do that because uh, you you pick a uh, maybe an eighteen year old boy or a girl and say talk about uh, give these people words of comfort and maybe he can or maybe uh, she can but not from the perspective of someone that experienced it you know so the concept of we chose on it among our people. We chose ani does not mean good health. We chose ani means your ability, your the resiliency that you have to bounce back and survive these life's stressors, the losses and all of this. How well do you bounce back from it? And if you bounce back uh, really strongly in a good way, then then you could say you have we chose ani. But people kind of take it out of context and they say good health, which uh, good health is important. Uh, and we also strive for that. But uh, how well can we survive these life stressors? You know, I mean, just imagine, think about the most uh, traumatic thing that could happen to you. Uh, and then how will you bounce back from that? How will you survive that? Uh, I mean, like, one, of, you know, I got a phone call when I was young, younger. My older brother died in Nebraska. So uh, from that, if the phone rings late at night, it triggers that again, triggers that. The bad news that I got, you know, my only brother passed away. You know, so now when the phone rings late at night, I jump and I actually get scared and maybe I have PTSD from it. I don't know, but I most likely do. But um, that's something that I really dread. <laughs> and some, a couple of times I chewed out people because they called my house and it was the wrong number and it wasn't really their fault, but I chewed them out for scaring me. So, um, so those things, you know, that we, we live with, you know, and I acknowledge it that, that I have that, you know, that, that trigger of that phone ringing late at night because a lot of times you know experience showed us that shows tells us that it's not usually good news when that phone rings you know late at night so there's among our people the unresolved grief so there's some people that carry their grief throughout mostly throughout their whole uh life uh they never put away they never resolved their grief and they they walk among us uh a lot of us you know that's happened to them so the symptoms of washigla ekignanka okishni is the unresolved grief is ishtima okipishni insomnia uh Ipayach wa echumpi, errors in judgment. Ochant hokechapi, personality changes. Hohu wa yazumpi, autoimmune disorders like arthritis. Chante wa yazumpi, heart disease. Kawachin kakijapi, emotional illness. So uh, whenever your grief is unresolved, the belief among our people is that it's going to uh, come out in a different way. It's going to come out in a sickness. So I have a, a very good friend who I call Chie. His name is Dr. Mark Butterbrook. And so when he was working at the Kyle Clinic, I said, 
I said, Chia, whenever you diagnose somebody with diabetes or heart trouble or even cancer, I said, ask them, have they had a recent loss? And then, so later on, he came back and he said, he said, you're right. He said, every one of them had a recent loss. So that's an example of how, because they didn't resolve their grief, it came out in a sickness. So um, that's really important that we find ways to um, resolve this grief in, in, our, in our people, in our communities. Uh, wiping of tears is good, is one of the things that was given to us by the spirits to resolve our grief. Uh, so when, what can organizations do to help? So social and emotional support, uh, supportive and compassionate responses, provide learning opportunities on grief and loss. So in our, um, in our communities, you know, uh, I remember I heard about this, a person that lost uh, their, their son to suicide. So uh, all of these employees got together and they gave, uh, they gave this person, uh, this uh, person there, some of their leave. So she was able to stay out longer than what was given to her, you know, the, the amount of, uh, the, the amount of time of the bereavement leave. So she was able to add on several more weeks till she was she was able to uh, get herself together enough to come back to work. So that's kind of the Lakota in us uh, showing coming up uh, because uh, I don't think you would see that outside in the uh, dominant society. I don't think you would see that. I, I don't I wouldn't see them doing that for somebody. They're kind of left on your own out there. But you know, in our in our society, one of the things I, I used to see, and I don't know if it's still there uh, to any degree, but I remember uh, when my father died, then uh, these people came right away in the in, during the night, and they came and they they came and it was like two o'clock at night, and they they brought us food, and uh, the man, the head of the family, he prayed for us, and they fed us, and they cried with us that, uh, at that time. And then throughout the next day, like people showed up and they brought us food and they comforted us and they fed us. And then, uh, and this uh, minister from uh, who was stationed at Our Lady of Lords, he came and prayed, you know, even though uh, we're not Christians, he still came and we welcomed it. And I thanked him for doing that because it was a show of support, you know, for us. So that's really important that we, if it's, if it's dying out, we need to revive these, these things among our people. So responding to someone in grief. Uh, so the things not to say is he or she is in a better place. He, uh, it's be you should try, you must really miss him or her. Uh, do not say he or she is not in pain anymore. Uh, instead, try, I know how special he or she was to you. Uh, and this one is kind of amusing. I don't know, but uh, you'll get married again. <laughs> That's the last thing that someone that lost her husband wants to hear. So instead, you could try, you're going through a very hard time. I'm here for you. Uh, if you you never you talk to somebody that lost a child, you never say to them you'll have other children. Um, or another one that really kind of rings empty to me is, you know, be strong. You know, um, I know they mean well by saying that, but uh, that's that's kind of like empty words because of the grief you're going to going through at the time. Time heals all wounds. It will get better soon. You know, uh, you don't really know that, uh, and that's pretty usually that someone that tells you that really doesn't know what you're going through. And instead, you could say, "How are the children doing?" And don't cry in front of the children. Uh, you never say that to them. These children know that 
it's a time of grief and a time of pain. And uh, it's kind of like hurting them if you, if you uh, try to like not acknowledge it. Uh, don't say anything at all, you know. Uh, if you're going to comfort somebody, uh, you could say, uh, I'm not sure what to say, but if you feel like talking, I'm here, you know, something like that, just to hear them up. So one of the things would be like a talking circle. Uh, the So like you could have a talking circle with people in grief and, you know, what is heard here stays here. Uh, one person talks at a time, reserve judgment, opinions, anokokta. Listen, just listen to them. And the word broken down is ah, come to attention, be alert. No go, record what is heard in your mind. And pata is turn it over, analyze, and reflect. So the Lakota mental health wellness is um, wazilia, smudging, wocheke, crying for a need, a prayer, a wokigna. So that's what these people do when they come to your home after they heard about your loss. They bring you food and they'll cry with you, talk to you, pray with you. That's a form of wokigna, comfort. Uh, praying to the morning star. So I remember uh, my grandfather used to do this every morning. He'll sing, still be dark sometimes outside. And he was a, a traditional healer. So uh, he would say that, that star changes a certain color. So it, they would, it would tell him that someone is coming to see him that day. So he would, if we were going to go to town, he used to say that he'll stay home because somebody was coming. And the times I stayed home with him to help him, I seen he was right. He never missed. Somebody would always show up. Um, offering to the spirits, example, food, tobacco, and material. Um, so wellness is Lakota. Uh, uh, So the many you have a check up, praying with water every morning before drinking it. Naki woke ya kapi, talking to the spirit of the loved one and to your own spirit. Seeing low wampi, singing or listening to songs to inspire good feelings. And then the istamnim we chakichi pakintapi, the wiping of tears uh, ceremony. Hold on here. My relatives, my screen froze up. Okay. So that's uh, kind of covering our responses to grief and how we handled it uh, among our people. So, Wopila uh, Tranka Chichapi, thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Lakshi. <clears throat> it's always informative. Would mm. you be willing to provide us with a closing tonight? Yes. Thank um, you. Ohetche <laughs> 
Og her til den gasle er rampe og der vøjste med at stjerne jakkerne. Hende ikke, hende han ikke, ikke dog har kan se, vi tog sådan en musik, og har ikke dog her op, ikke der her til højtid. Og når vi tog kød, så var det vores hivende her til øjertek, vi tager jo tak ved nisten i kra, og her til her en kvap, der var noget trukata, og kan jeg dog kære han i, i uskene og gå hjem, og kan jeg her til at kære måne i byg, det lå til gasle. Og her til du vel over her med tak, jeg skal. Thank you so very much. I want to thank everybody 